morning. That works. Thanks, everybody, for coming out on this rainy morning. Hopefully this doesn't stay around too long, but we do need the rain. Uh, we've got a nice program for you today. Uh, Tom Dunn from the town and the emergency management office is here to speak about uh, what we see every summer, and that's hurricanes and preparedness uh, for those hurricanes. Um, I want to remind everybody that uh, we do film these, and uh, at the end we have Q&A. When Tom is here also, after him, he has to go to another meeting, so we're going to do a quick Q&A for Tom, specifically after his presentation. Wait for the microphones, if you would, and Amanda and Jared will be bringing those around to you to uh, uh, get your questions in for Tom, and then uh, he'll respond for you. Uh, we also have Amanda giving some uh, updates on events as well as um, some information on the website. Uh, talk a little bit more about our digital signage. Russell Fredericks, our new director of maintenance, will make his first appearance at a community coffee. So uh, excited to have Russell here. And uh, Toby will come in and talk a little bit about uh, Tower Beach, our commercial vehicle gate fees, and uh, then we'll take a quick break, five minute break, and then open up to uh, Q&A. So with that, I'd like to introduce Tom Dunn. Tom? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, before I get started, uh, on, the, on the table over there, I've got a couple items that uh, you can take, can take along with you. First is our, the town's emergency preparedness guide. Uh, the first half is designed for information on all the hazards that impact or potentially could impact the island. And the back half is, is, uh, is actually a step-by-step -step instructions on how to develop uh, an emergency kit and an emergency plan. So it's, a, it's designed for you to take with you and actually write in it and, and utilize it. Uh, we also have uh, over there, uh, anybody grab one of the tubes out of the, uh, out of the box over there? That's a tube kit. It's, a, it's an emergency kit for your car. It's got a little uh, a drink of water in there. It's got a uh, so glow stick. It's got some other, other neat stuff in there. So please feel free to grab one on the way out. Uh, the other piece that I'll talk about really quickly is uh, Smart 911. That's a service that's uh, provided by Buford County and is also utilized in the 911 center here on the island. Uh, you can go create a profile just like you would in a, in a social media account, but this is a secure profile and, and only people that have access to it are the 911 centers. So you can go in and, and put your information as little or as much as you'd like. Um, for example, you can put your vehicle information. So if your vehicle is stolen, you dial 911, they can pull up a picture of that car and potentially send it out to the, to the troopers or, or to the, uh, the county deputies or whoever's responding to that, to that event. Um, the other nice thing about it is you can, it's, it's mobile. Um, so if you go to Chicago and you stay in a hotel, you can update your pro profile on the short term so here's the hotel I'm staying at, and here's the phone number. So at least if you dial 911 on your cell phone, they don't get an answer. They at least have a place to start, and they know you're not here but in, in Chicago. So it's a great service that, that's free and, and provided by the county. All right, so I know we want to talk about hurricanes, but just really quickly, what are some of the other hazards or what are the, some of the other potential hazards that we face here on the island? What are some things that we, 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 can, we can see? Obviously, hurricanes are the obvious one. What else? Flooding, right? Fire, exactly right. Anything else? <clears throat> Tornado alligators, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, somebody said tourists the other day. Um, <clears throat> what, what, what else is out there? How about, how about earthquakes? Yeah. Can anybody tell me when the last earthquake in South Carolina was? Try May 18th. Yes, May 18th, we had a, it's like a 2.1 up, up just south of Charleston. Uh, how, many, how many earthquakes have we had in South Carolina so far this year? It's, a, it's right at about 12. I can't, it's either 12 or 13. Yeah, there's a lot of, they happen fairly regular and they're very small. Um, the last major earthquake was in the 1800s in Charleston, but it's still, still, a, uh, still a potential here. Um, the other one that, that nobody mentioned was terrorism. Obviously, that's in, the, that's in the news. We have a lot of military facilities here in Beaufort County and a, a, uh, a little event that takes place down here once a year that brings in a lot of people. So that is a, is a potential for us. Uh, I'll talk about 2016 and the storms. Um, you, it's kind of hard to see, but you, I put a circle in there. Four storms impacted the island last year. Um, Hermine and Matthew being the two big ones, but we also had Bonnie and Colin, one come in the back door and one in the front. So the four storms impacted us last year. So it wasn't just about Matthew, it was about, about other things. And Hermine actually for fire rescue, that was the busiest day that we've ever had. And so 
you know, we and we still had a lot of damage from 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 Hermine. Uh, I'll briefly talk about Hurricane Matthew. Um, simple slide by the numbers. The the top the top two are probably the most important. We had there were zero deaths and uh, and, and zero injuries directly related to the storm and and the folks that decided to stay. Um, we had. We evacuated as well. We shut down the entire town. All of our public safety resources and critical town staff evacuated as well. We went to, to USCB, which is our base camp. And at base camp, we had about 145 town staff and 599 public safety assets at base camp with a, and a multitude of different organizations and agencies. Um, one of the things that I didn't know when I got here was that we have an MOU with the county that, that I get to write the plan for, for, for that. So, had I known that, I may have thought twice. Um, <laughs> it's like herding cats. Um, so after the storm, uh, we, we, had, we put five push crews together, so we had five teams go out uh, initially, and that was our debris contractor, fire rescue folks. Um, they had law enforcement component in there. We had uh, Hilton Head uh, PSD and Broad Creek PSD, which housed with us at, at base camp, and Palmetto Electric. So we all came back in, in one unit and pushed and began working towards our critical facilities. Um, then we upped that to 10 within within 24 hours. So we had 10, 10 crews working to, to push roads initially in the first 24 hours. And, you know, to me, that, that the big number is uh, 200 million plus cubic yards of debris. Um, I was at the hurricane conference a couple of months ago, and even the other contractors were blown away that our contractor was able to do essentially 2 million cubic yards in 90 days, that they were just floored that they were able to accomplish that. I know it seemed like it took them a long time, but it was a uh, it was actually a fairly quick operation in, in, as far as the industry goes. And the other number I think is pretty intriguing is we uh, we did a little math and we had 389 years of experience in our EOC, and that's just time with the town. So we had one employee, um, one of our fire marshals. Uh, she started on Monday prior to the storm. So <clears throat> yeah, yeah, if, yeah. She was literally putting pencils in her desk when we said, "Come on, you're coming with us to the EOC." So she she pulled that number down. You know, I pulled that number down. I only have five years with the town. Uh, we had we had some with 35 years with the town, so they kind of average it out. But that doesn't take into account the other 20 plus years experience that I have somewhere else that she had somewhere else. So I think that's a pretty in interesting number. Um, what went well? Um, I think the, the the thing that went most well was relationships, is and being able to build the relationships that we have over the course of time. Um, we think we did pretty good on our EOC operations. We think our base camp went pretty good. Um, that's a picture of our, our fuel tanker at uh, Hilton Head Plantation. We have an agreement with them and to be able to purchase fuel from them. We had a fuel truck actually turn around on his way here because he heard the word evacuation on the radio and, and turned around. So we, we were limited on our fuel so that, that MOU came into, and came into play really well. Um, I say reentry. That's our reentry, our ability to get back on the island, our ability to get to the critical facilities we think went pretty well. Uh, some lessons learned, uh, processes we're going to do, we need to do a better job on how we track our time, how we track our actions, and just catalog that information in a better, more usable fashion moving forward for that FEMA reimbursement. Um, staff assignments, we're going to utilize our staff a little better. Our evacuated staff really didn't have a task, so we, we, we've we now working on assigning those folks things to do. One of the things that we're going to work on is a social media team is what we're calling it. So the folks that are sitting in Columbia, sitting in Aiken, sit, sitting in Augusta, wherever they go, they can log in, they can monitor social media, and they can help us with that public information piece. Um, education, that was one of the, probably the biggest one for me. Uh, if you look at all the, the FEMA literature and all the information out there, it says plan for 72 hours. How long were you guys evacuated? <laughs> exactly right. So I need to change my message. Now, you need to plan for a week at least, maybe more, because, you know, that was a small storm in, in the great, great scheme of things. Um, one of the other things was uh, we need to keep our EOC open a little longer to help coordinate and, and keep that, that flow of information between us and all of our external partners. And, and obviously the other one was fuel, as I mentioned earlier, and we were able to purchase a new-to-us fuel tanker that's a little bit larger. We had planned on replacing our fuel tanker with a smaller trailer, and we realized that during this storm that that smaller trailer would have put us in a bad position. So we've, we've, we've purchased a, a little bit larger truck that has a little bit more capability. So just really briefly on the, the hurricane forecast, those are the numbers. Uh, Colorado State, which is an odd one for hurricane prediction estimates, but I like it because they pick a number. 
Um, the NOAA is, uh, is, is a little bit higher. They're predicting above average season, and the Weather Channel is pretty close in the same number as they are. So, but these numbers are interesting, but they're really, they're really irrelevant because it only takes one. A couple of new products are one really major product coming from the National Hurricane Center, Center is a weather timing graphic. So you'll see this, this one on the on probably the Weather Channel and on TV and on the web. Um, it's their estimation of the arrival of tropical storm force winds. Um, that's probably the one that I'm most excited about because it gives us some ability to to, to plan better and, and look better into the future instead of taking verbal you know, talking to the weather service and what do they think. It's actually a visual graphic that we can put into play and put into our plans and, and push out. Um, the other one is they're going to start issuing watches and warnings or potential wa potentially issue watches and warnings for storms that have not been named yet. So if we get a Bonnie that is trying to form off the coast, they believe it's going to form in the next 48 hours, they may issue a tropical storm watch. So you may see that watch come up before the storm is given a name. So that's just something to pay attention to and to, to, to realize may happen. And the Hurricane Center has updated some of their graphics and their colors to make it more visually pleasing. <laughs> uh, I throw this up there because uh, the, to me the, the category really is not that, that relevant. Um, what was Matthew when it went by us? Anybody know? It was a two, right. What, were, what would you say what the conditions on the island were? One. We were a bottom end one. The highest wind recorded was a gust of 89 miles an hour. So you look at 89, that's, that's about middle of a cat one. So the sustained winds were much closer to there. It's a 74, 75. I've, I've seen numbers of 80. They're, they're a little bit all over the place. But we were a, the conditions on the island were a low-end category one. So put that into perspective. And one of our contractors said something the other day that it was – I like the way he worded it, but he said Matthew was a dry storm in the great scheme of things from a debris standpoint. We didn't have a lot of flooded homes. We didn't have a lot of that type of debris. So you put a larger storm with larger storm surge, you know, that that changes everything. Matthew could have come at us the same way. So don't focus on the category. Focus on what the weather service is saying, what we're saying about potential conditions. Right. I won't spend a lot of time on it because it's all in the, uh, in the book that, that you can pick up on the way out. But, you know, the way I the way I look at uh, prepare, preparedness, excuse me, is it's all about you. You know, you can read a book, you can read, take my checklist all day long, but it's really about you. How you live your life, what what you have. Do you have a dog? Do you have a cat? Do you have a snake? Do you have a parrot? You need to you need to plan for the way you live your life. You have an oxygen machine. You need to plan for taking that machine with you, and you need to plan for spare O2 tanks. You know, so just look at the way you live your life. Oops. There we go. Critical paperwork, I know that's a, a, a mind-numbing list, but again, it's, you don't need everything that's on that list. It's, it's, it's how you live your life and the way you live your life. So take the documents that are critical, that are important to you. And I mentioned your, your dogs, cats, snakes, turtles, whatever you have. Plan for them just like you do you. I mean, if your dog has got a special pillow he likes to lay on, Take it with you, because if he doesn't have his special pillow, he's probably going to be grumpy. And if he's grumpy, you're grumpy. So <laughs> just like you plan for your pets. And don't please don't leave them behind. Um, information from the town, we're on Facebook, social media, or Facebook and Twitter. Um, we use Facebook pretty hard during the storm, and we also use used Twitter. Um, I would say Facebook is probably your best avenue to get information from us and, uh, and the images that come along with it. And we are actively finding better or looking for better ways to get the message out and to provide you with a clear picture of what the conditions are on the ground. Uh, Reentry, um, you know, that, that, that says it all. When I talked about planning five days or more, um, be patient. I mean, it, 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 it was a lot of debris and a lot of mess to clean up. And the quicker you guys get back here, the more it slows that process down, the more it, it, it makes it more difficult to get the water back on, to get the sewer back and the, and the power back. So just please be patient and listen to, to what we're saying on Facebook and, and the county and the sheriff's office is saying on, on their, on their, with their press releases. I think, I think that's it. And that's, that's all I have pretty quick. And I'd uh, be more than happy to answer any questions if you have any. We'll take questions for Tom at this point. Please remember to use the microphone and wait for the mic to come to you. Given the um, um, mild nature of Matthew and the low level of the winds, are 
the forestry practices on Hilton Head appropriate? Uh, that's one that I can't answer. That would need to go to community development or one of those folks to to to, to talk about. Um, I don't I don't deal in those political issues. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but I can get you a name. Tom, will you back here? Oh, sorry. <laughs> will you touch on the fact uh, about the notice of evacuation that was issued by the governor and the importance of people evacuating when that notice is given? Uh, when we left here in Sea Pines, we, we thought that we had about 15 people that elected to stay behind. And when we got back, we realized that that was probably more of the tunes of about 50 people that rode the storm out. We need to touch on the importance of when the evacuation is, is, is given, people need to listen to the evacuation and leave. Right. Absolutely. That, that decision is not made lightly. Um, the governor takes into account all the information that's available. So if she's making that decision, it's solid information coming from the National Weather Service, coming from the Hurricane Center, and coming locally from, from us on the ground. So if the governor makes that call, please, please heed that call. Um, we are just discussing earlier on, on elevations. You know, the elevation just over here at the fire station is only eight feet. You know, we had, we had six feet of storm surge, and we were lucky that it didn't hit at, at high tide. So you put 12 and 15 feet of storm surge from a larger storm, you're going to be underwater. So if you choose to stay, you're, you, you, you may be choosing to lose your life. So please, please, please heed that order. Other questions for Tom? Just a quick, quick easy when you talk about Facebook. Which Facebook? Because <laughs> if you Google... Hilton yep. Better Sea Pines, there's a lot of them. So which one sure. are you referring if, to? If you go to the town's website, in the top right-hand corner, there's a, there's a link to Facebook. Hit that one. And you should see the, the checkbox beside it. That, that it's a, the, the, I can't remember what it's called, but Facebook's official. This is an official and a confirmed site. But if you go through the town's website on the top right-hand corner, it's a link to our Twitter page, our Facebook page, and then our e-subscription service. Separately, if you're looking for information from CSA Sea Pines, ours would be www.facebook.com backslash Sea Pines Living. So we were pushing Great. at that time during the hurricane for Matthew, we were pushing all of what the town was pushing Absolutely. because they were the communicator that we were getting our information and, from. And, and I'll follow up on that is if you guys are on your you're on social media, please, if you see that message from us, that information, please forward it along because that's the – you go to that credible source, and the more you can get the credible source moving, the more – more people will see that information and get that information. Right. Other questions for Tom? Excuse me. Uh, at least from my experience, uh, you know, evacuation, or at least we heeded the, the warning early, and, and the recovery seemed to be going well. The one spot that I sore spot was reentry. Mm -hmm. there, there it really appeared to be a, a gross miscommunication as to when, how, all that kind of stuff. Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, there, there was some issues with the, uh, the, the reentry as far as initially the governor said Beaufort County is open and that all of Beaufort County was not open. That was not the case. Uh, I know that her staff was given the information that we were not ready to receive people. Um, so that was problem number one. Uh, two, there's a, there's a state reentry system in place. Um, it's not designed for reentry. It's designed for a business or whoever to validate that they have a valid business license for the area. And a lot of a lot of entities were utilizing that, showing up at the checkpoints and saying, "Hey, I've got a reentry pass," which they didn't have, and that clogged things up. Um, I, I won't speak for the sheriff, but I know that they're actively he controls the reentry process. Um, I was in a meeting the other day, and they're they're adjusting that that plan to to make it smoother, to make it cleaner. Um, I, I don't know the specifics just yet, but I know that they're they're actively making adjustments to that plan to make it a better a better means. So I, I don't have any more from you that, but we're, we're trying to make sure that, that it becomes a smoother process, yes. Any other questions for Tom before we move on? Thank you so much, Tom. We certainly appreciate awesome. it. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Amanda Sutcliffe-Jones. I am the CSA Director of Communications. I know Tom has just stepped up, but I cannot encourage you enough. Please be prepared. As your Director of Communications, I plead with you, if we are having a tropical storm, regardless of what it is, even up to a hurricane, please make the necessary precautions. Um, being a part of this process during Hurricane Matthew was, you know, 
I really wanted to get you guys as much information as I could, so I just I plead with you to make sure that you take the necessary precautions and steps to, to make sure that you're ready for it. So I am going to cover some upcoming events for us. In June, we have our ASPO board meeting on June 22nd. It's here in this building at 9 a.m. We also have our CSA board meeting. That meeting has been moved. It typically is held on Tuesday, and um, that would have been the 27th. It has been moved to Monday, June 26th. It will be at 3 p.m., and it will be in this building. So please note that that um, date has changed to Monday, June 26th. In July and August, we do not typically have any CSA or ASPO board meetings, so we will not have um, any CSA or ASPO board meetings in the month of July or in August. Our community coffee, we also do not have a coffee like this meeting in July. Our next coffee is scheduled for um, August 2nd, which is the first Wednesday in August. We are working diligently over at CSA to also finalize some details um, for our Sea Pines Property Owners Independence Day celebration. We, hope, we held that last year at Tower Beach, and we're working to facilitate um, caterers and different um, processes to get that event announced to the community. So as soon as that date is selected and the time is selected, we'll make sure to get the information over to you guys. Next on the agenda, just touching on our website, cpinesliving.com. Just by a quick show of hands, who has had a chance to check the website out? Phenomenal. If you have not, please do so. It's www.cpinesliving.com. It is a fully redeveloped and redesigned website, so we encourage you to take a look at it. Um, from a property owner's perspective, there's actually a property owner link. It's in the top left-hand corner, and that's where you would find all of your resources. You do not have to have a member login to go to that section of the, um, of the site. It is completely available for you to use. There is a member um, My Account section, so if you're interested in looking at your My Account section, you can certainly do so. You would use the email that you received from um, the email that you signed up with CSA to use, and then you would use your property owner guest pass code as your password. So if you guys have any questions about that, please let me know afterwards. We also encourage feedback, questions, concerns, comments, anything of the like um, regarding the website to info at csacpines.com. That email comes directly to me um, and myself and Jean, who's our communications coordinator, are happy to take those questions, comments, or concerns about the website so we can make sure we're continue to improve it for you guys. Now I'm going to touch on our digital community signage. We've talked about this a couple different times. I just want to bring it to the attention of the group. A um, couple different things to talk about and some key points. The concepts for this community digital signage were presented at our coffees in February, March, April and May. So it has been communicated to the property owners and to the public. We tested the signs and what this means is we have a, um, a sign that has to be changed out manually currently. We're looking to do a community digital sign so we can really emphasize and utilize the technology that we'd have from the convenience of the office rather than having to have our maintenance crew go out there and change it manually. Um, we did have some concerns about the size of the scales um, of the sign, so we actually created a temporary two-scale sign, and it was a mock-up that was installed temporarily, very short time frame, at both the Greenwood Gate and also the ocean gate and that was used to check sight lines so we could ensure that there were no traffic blockages or any type of sight line issues so that was done in April in May we actually had our coffee on May 3rd the following day the um, sign renderings and the sign design went to the Maintenance Enhancements and Major Projects Committee, which is a CSA committee, and the MEMP committee approved the sign, and it also went to the Architectural Review Board. They also approved the sign on May 4th, which was a later meeting that afternoon. The digital community sign order will be placed today, and it does take about a 10 to 11 week lead time for it to actually be delivered into Sea Pines, and then we would um, begin the installation process, and our expectation to have it fully installed is sometime between late August and early September for us. So please keep in mind that that is coming to the community. We have received the appropriate approvals um, from the board, from MEMP, which is the Maintenance Enhancement Major Projects Committee, as well as the Sea Pines Architectural Review Board. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Russell Fredrex. He is our new CSA Director of Maintenance. We certainly welcome, welcome him. He's been with us for a couple weeks now. 
Three weeks, wow, fresh off the boat, yay. Um, so we're going to have him come up. It is his first coffee, so take it easy on him. Um, and we'll take, uh, we'll welcome Rus Russell to the stage. Thank you, Russell. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, certainly glad to be, I'm glad to be here and uh, made my way down here from uh, New York City. I spent the last 19 years working in Central Park for the Central Park Conservancy as, and uh, since 2008 as the chief of operations responsible for the daily operations, everything from the special events to sanitation to the horticulture uh, to community relations to everything that kind of goes on there on uh, seven days a week. And so. Obviously, uh, New York is a pretty intense place. Uh, I saw the park certainly change over the years from when I started in 1997 to, uh, to uh, last year when we went from about 20 million visits a year to 40, 42 million visits a year. So that's more visitation than Times Square. Uh, and certainly uh, with those changes, it really gave us some real significant challenges as far as maintenance goes. And we really had to find some really uh, unique and innovative ways to respond to those challenges as far as ongoing operations in, in relation to tree care, uh, turf care, and some other, some other necess you know, really uh, necessary uh, functions of keeping the park really uh, it's, uh, looking its best. So I'm really looking forward to you know, bringing all that experience here to Sea Pines and uh, putting that to work and uh, really uh, looking forward to continuing to enhancing the, the, the uh, community. And certainly I could share a lot of uh, New York stories and a lot of things I saw through, <laughs> through the years firsthand, and I could probably bore you with a couple of those now, but certainly it's uh, the change here in uh, the first couple of weeks, you know, I kind of went to work, I was looking for the A train uh, station, <laughs> and, and, and I'm not used to uh, quite getting in the car every day, but. <laughs> It's, uh, it, and uh, those sorts of changes have uh, been uh, a little bit challenging. But uh, again, I'm happy to be here. i um, been, been visiting the Hilton Head area for about the last 30 years, uh, vacationing uh, mostly in Palmetto Dunes. And then uh, my parents actually moved down here, and retired here a bunch of years ago. So um, you know, I think one of the things that really struck me more recently is seeing that you know certainly all the damage from Hurricane Matthew uh, back in when I came back down here in December, uh, just for the holidays, and it was really kind of heartbreaking to see that. Uh, you know, through the years, I've always developed that passion for the outdoors and, and horticulture, and, and kind of seeing all that tree damage and the homes damaged here was really, again, uh, really a heartbreaking thing to see. But I'm really happy to see the, you know, the uh, community bouncing back and uh, things uh, coming back together. And I just wanted to share some uh, uh, real quickly a firsthand experience from. Uh, that I saw in, in New York City uh, with hurricanes, you know, when Sandy kind of came up uh, the coast there and really devastated things. And I think many of, many of you probably saw that news. And uh, one of the things, one of my main charges there was uh, deploying resources for uh, tree care. And uh, I had the opportunity to work around uh, uh, several of the boroughs throughout Manhattan uh, once we had gotten the park cleaned up. Uh, with some tree care contractors, and we were actually pulling a lot of trees off of homes in Staten Island and Queens and uh, into Brooklyn. Uh, but I just want to emphasize uh, some of the things that uh, Tom mentioned earlier, and certainly what Amanda uh, mentioned as well, but safety is, is a premium. And uh, I did see a lot of folks trying to attempt tree care on their own, uh, walking under trees, those sorts of things, but uh, tree care, as we know, as we all know, is best left to the professionals. Uh, you know, trees are very dynamic, uh, especially once they've fallen, and uh, certainly avoiding walking under uh, or attempting to pull the tree off the house yourself is something that uh, should be avoided. Uh, but I just wanted to share some of those thoughts and uh, uh, with you today, and uh, just wanted to talk to talk uh, this morning just about our ongoing maintenance uh, here at Sea Pines and some of the. Uh, some of the maintenance uh, processes that we're putting in place, and uh, certainly at the main gates, uh, we want you know, we really want to have these areas looking spick and span every day as as uh, visitors are coming out. And one of those is certainly uh, power washing power washing the entrances, um, and that's something that uh, we employed uh, you know in uh, 
in New York uh, on a daily basis. Anyone that's been to the city, uh, you'll see all the, uh, the doormen out there washing down the streets and everyone out there with the pressure washers. So uh, again, this is something here in Sea Pines that we're, insti you know, um, we're instituting along with the ongoing street sweeping um, throughout the property. Um, but again, focusing on a lot of key areas uh, and again, uh, putting a real emphasis on, on the gates. Uh, this happened to be some uh, the power washing that we've already completed back at Ocean Gate uh, just the other day. Another another small, uh, well, not so small project uh, is down in South Beach. Uh, we uh, installed this uh, split rail fence uh, adjacent to the bike path to uh, eliminate parking. Uh, you know, the parking was occurring down there. Vehicles were um, backing across the bike lane, so this was a, a safety uh, concern. So again, installing the uh, split rail fence along that stretch of bike path will eliminate vehicles uh, from pulling in and uh, out uh, of that location. Uh, ongoing uh, sign maintenance, uh, you know, it's continuous. Uh, as we all know, unfortunately, signs are, um, you know, deteriorate over time and also struck by vehicles or what have you. So our sign crew is out there on a, on a daily basis responding to these uh, repair requests and keeping our, our signage looking uh, the best it can out there. And uh, many of you may have noticed out as you're exiting and entering the community um, that uh, we're, we're currently um, uh, replacing in, uh, all the, the floral displays out there, seasonal displays. So um, those, those are, uh, as in the past, are, those are available back at our maintenance facility if anyone's interested in picking up the, uh, the uh, displays that were, uh, we currently removed. And the, uh, the, the uh, annual mosquito spraying will, is um, in, in uh, progress and that will start next week uh, to, keep those, to keep the mosquitoes at bay as, uh, as we've done in the past, along with the uh, ongoing aquatic uh, vegetation uh, management uh, as well, uh, keeping the uh, duckweed and algae uh, in check on, on the, uh, throughout the lagoons and the property. And then just our, uh, our ongoing uh, road and leisure uh, trail repairs, uh, you know, fixing any potholes that are out there and uh, other, other needs as, as they arise uh, through the season. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the street uh, street sweeping uh, that the, uh, is taking place on a, on a routine basis. So if anyone does have any questions on that, we could certainly uh, answer that uh, afterwards. And uh, I'll turn it back to Amanda. So again, thank you. Uh, excited to be here uh, with the CSA team and uh, looking forward to working with everyone uh, in the community here. So thanks. Thank you so much, Russell. Thank you, Russell. We'll have Toby McSwain, our Director of Safety, Security, and Transportation, come to the podium. And Toby will update us on some security items. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, just a couple of quick updates. Um, security department, we seem to be going uh, pretty good. Uh, so if any of you are looking for a job, um, <laughs> we have a shortage. I'm down, uh, we were down seven people at one point. Uh, we're back to, uh, I still have an opening for three, so if any of you have carried a gun in the past and can shoot straight, <laughs> we've got some openings. Um, for the most part, our um, the security department, I mean, we've not had anything major that's occurred over the last month. Uh, we have had one burglary uh, that's occurred. It was not a forced entry burglary, uh, and the property owner was really... Um, doesn't know when it actually occurred. It was an item in the house. Uh, the house had received some storm damage and there was things missing. So we're trying to kind of pinpoint when that would occur. But for the most part, things are going pretty pretty good in the community. Uh, they're, they're here. Um, <clears throat> uh, we're, and that's where it seems the majority of our calls for service. Uh, it's our late night, uh, swimming in the pools loud music, uh, parking violations. Uh, that seems to be what we're, the calls for service that we're running right now. I uh, would like to touch on uh, the bike safety. Um, just so if you guys are new to the community, just to kind of let you know, last year, the, now I'm not talking about rental, bicycle rental companies inside of Sea Pines that operate in, inside of our footprint. This is just a outside rental companies brought in 41,000 bicycles for delivery last year in Sea Pines. So you can imagine this is the season, everyone's on the bike, so please use caution because they, some 
follow the rules and regulations. Others do not. A lot of small kids, so please be cautious. We have had some, some accidents already. Here in the last month, we've had four people that's been struck by a motor vehicle. Uh, thank goodness they were all minor, um, but please use some caution when, when driving. Um, the other thing is um, bicycle safety. Uh, I've just covered that. Uh, the dogs. We're back to having issues with pets running loose, and I'll just pretty much state the state law is your animal, whatever that may be, can run around your property off of a leash. When you leave your property, state law requires your animal to be on a leash. That also goes for the forest preserve. I know it's a big piece of real estate, and you kind of out there, you cannot let your animal off the leash inside the forest preserve either. Um, we have had some bites that's occurred. Uh, I will say that the, the three bites that have occurred have been visitors that brought their pet with them that has bitten someone else. Uh, so please use caution, but uh, it's an expensive ticket. Um, and we, we really um, try to, to stick with the policy of the state that you got to have your animal on a leash. There's too many people running around here, bites, it's just, it's a bad thing. And we've had some serious injuries over the last years where it didn't necessarily result in a bite, but on someone else's pet has jumped up on another prop owner and they have falling and hit their head on a curb, multiple surgeries. I mean, it's just a, the, the worst case scenario. So please um, help us with that. Um, commercial gate fee increase. Um, if you're not aware, starting June 1st, the commercial gate entry fee went to $10. Um, that would include whether you pull in a trailer or not. So just kind of give you a recap. If you were a landscaper that did not purchase a yearly decal through CSA, you could pay daily coming in to service um, properties and sea pines, and it was $6. The gate entry committee, along with the CSA board, approved this, I believe, in March to take effect June 1st. So we have started that program. So now if your landscaper or your power washer or anyone comes to you and says, I got to raise your bill, well, it, it is $10. So whether that's a landscaping, you know, whatever the case may be, all commercial vehicles outside of the daily casual visitor is $10. And that's taking place started already uh, June 1st. Uh, Tower Beach. Uh, we are operating Tower Beach seven days a week between 8 and 4. Uh, the, at the last CSA board meeting, we are working towards a policy that we hope to have finished up, revised, to back to the CSA board uh, for them to make a decision on the operation of what's going to occur, who's going to have access, that kind of stuff at Tower Beach. So we're hoping to have that wrapped up back to the board. There was an issue that was brought to the CSA board that in the evening times, and I, you know, I guess I can, I can agree with this, that the property owners like to sit at Tower Beach, the sun goes down, you're having a cocktail, and we lock the, the, the lockers up right at 8 o'clock, or there before uh, is what it's been. We're extending that to, to 9 o'clock at night. So if you want to sit out on the beach and enjoy yourself and then come in, we're going to send patrol down when available sometime around 9 o'clock to lock up the lockers for the remaining of the evening. Um, so that that's a new change. So. You don't have to rush back to, to get it back or leave something outside. It's just, and it's nice, and it's still at 8 o'clock. There's still plenty of uh, light out uh, that you can uh, enjoy uh, Tower Beach. So that is a new, a new change as well. In addition to the hours and when available, we're going to put staff at Tower Beach at the guardhouse until 9 o'clock at night. Uh, right now we have it covered seven days a week between 8 and 4. We're going to extend those hours until 9 p.m. So that way there's an attendant there. Uh, and i got to tell you, since we've started staffing Tower Beach, there's only been one day that we've completely run out of parking spots. So we record everything that goes in, everything that goes out, and there's been one day that we've, we've exceeded the parking. So there uh, has always been plenty of parking available. Um, now, it's not a full lot, but we're also not at capacity at any given time. Uh, so there's still plenty of spots, but there is some changes coming forth, and that will come from the, the CSA board. And the last, uh, just to touch on Tom, um, I do appreciate Tom coming here today. Uh, him and I, we work too, too closely together during Matthew, uh, but I just want to let you know what we're working on from a CSA standpoint. When we evacuated during Matthew, uh, 28 of us went to Barmore, South Carolina. That's 90 miles from Hilton Head. 
it's a long ways. When we got ready to make re-entry, we literally left Barnwell and went three miles and there's a power line down across the road. So we were kind of stuck. So we're making a plan now and I'm working with two hotels trying to get under contract in the Bluffton area where the CSA staff that's going to work any type of evacuation process, we're going to go to Bluffton to ride the storm out, a category one, possibly category two, depending on the circumstance, so that we're near uh, Tom and the staff at USCB. Uh, we had a meeting with, with the local officials. I know the sheriff is trying to find space for the PUDs to have a contingent at USCB. Um, I don't know where they're going to do this. I think with the 599 people that were there, they were, I don't know if you could put a sheet of paper in that building because it was at max capacity. I mean, because they had cots everywhere. So I don't know where we would go if we went there. But our plan is, is to take our team, go to Bluffton, ride it out, stage our equipment at USCB because all of our equipment then when we went to Barmel, everything left sea pines. We didn't leave anything behind. And when we came back, we brought everything back and we've since, I believe, are under contract for two skidders that played a major role in opening our roadways up because I, I don't care to ever touch a chainsaw ever again because <laughs> I will tell you some of the stuff that fell in the roadway was huge. I mean, big trees and it just it took a lot of effort and to have two skidders that where we can just push stuff out of the roadway is going to be a is big very big help to us so our plan is to change category one and two uh, we're actually asking staff to sign up to who wants to go to bluffton to ride the storm out in a category one or two and you can imagine the, the list is pretty short <clears throat> um, but we're planning our, that is our plan to take 28 to 30 people so when we make re-entry we come back and we start just like we did before. We start cutting and pushing and, and doing what we have to do to get the community open back up. Outside of a category two, we're probably going back to Barmel, which is where the town of Hilton Head will go. They go to Barmel High School. Um, and it's and it's in which Tom and I had a lengthy conversation about this, is that, you know, what were you faced with when you got ready to leave Barmel? Well, three miles outside, there's a power line down across the road. And we're trying to get all of our reentry people back to Beaufort County to start a push and we're 90 miles from the island um, but please we're, we're working on that plan but I do ask we I will tell you our efforts when we got back to sea pines is clear the roads but there was three properties that we had to take oxygen to because the people didn't evacuate and they had run out so don't don't put us in the position I have that was you know here we've got bicycles and everything we do to try to get oxygen tanks to these people please leave uh, and we did. We worked as hard as we could to get these roads open back up, and it was not an easy process, and it does take time, and we are, the communication, the reentry has got to be key because it was, there was a lot of miscommunication that was passed during the last storm, and that's all I have. Thank you. Let's keep the uh, break short, maybe just a couple, two, three minutes, and then we'll come back for Q&A. Thanks. It's on, I have a question um, between a Lighthouse Road Villas and Wildwoods Spa. There's a ditch, a drainage ditch, a ditch, a something that has trees down over it, dark green scum all over it, and mosquitoes galore. Is, is that on the list to be? Jared, do you know where we are? Or is that on? I'll, I'll have to check where the property is, and I'll see if it's our ownership or the or the regime. We'll look into it. Yeah, we've got a few regimes that have not done much cleanup on their properties, so we're trying to encourage them to do that. And yes, yeah, but we'll we can identify the piece and see who the owner is and see what that is. But okay, other questions? Okay. <laughs> Hi, Rosemary Kimball. I'm just wondering, um, with the article in the paper the other day about Lawton Stables, many of us are very upset to hear that the tennis courts might take over Lawton, Lawton Stables there in front. And of course, the stables are using that pasture land, so I hope this isn't, I mean, are they still looking for other venues, I hope? Because I think a lot of us are very much against having tennis courts in place of 
the pasture at Lawton Stables. Yeah. Uh, quite frankly, I'm not getting involved yeah, in that stuff, but we've got a couple people here who are involved in that. If they, you know, uh, Barry or oh, good. Uh, yeah, we I know were you've just been, you had some communication in that area. Oh, great. I don't have much to add. I must tell you, I was surprised to see the article in the packet. I, 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 on one hand, on the other hand, I was glad to see uh, Stan Smith's, you know, involvement in it, regardless of where it's going to be. It's so important for Stan Smith and the Smith Stearns Academy, you know, to stay here in Sea Pines. I know the resort, Steve and Cliff, are really kind of struggling on where to put the courts, as the article said. Uh, there's a certain number of courts that they need not only to satisfy the guests for the resort, but also um, th the needs to support the Smith Stearns Academy. So I think it's like 16 to 18 courts or something like that. So I don't have any further details on that. Um, I, it looked, sounded to me like the way the article was written, it was a fait accompli. If that's the case, I don't know anything about that. You know, I just know that it was still, you know, very much under consideration. And as you all know, uh, that's pretty much their call, you know, in terms of where, uh, where those are going to be placed. So um, that's all I can add to, to this right now. So, okay. Other questions? Frank? Uh, a comment and a question. A uh, comment is in the paper, in the packet and also on our local TV station, um, uh, people or articles said that the gate fee went up to $10 a vehicle, and that was false information. And I think it's really important that you folks uh, counter that false information with some statement or whatever that says it's only for commercial vehicles, because I think that sends out a message it's, that we are an arrogant community, and that's not a good thing at all. I'll take that. So that's my comment. Um, you, don't, you don't have I mean, to answer it. But. I would like to address it. So we did send that information, the correct information, that it was just related to the commercial vehicle gate entry fee to those media sources, and they still ran what they ran. So just so you are aware, we certainly communicated with them the correct information in advance of the change taking place. The, the second is a question. Uh, Toby's adding to his empire is, is now the director of transportation. What does that mean? Toby? I didn't Trolleys. Trolleys. <laughs> Toby, and he's been the director of transportation since, I think, actually before he I got here. Yeah. Yeah, so that's not, not an ad. Mm -mm. Recent one, anyway. Right. <laughs> May go to Barry. Okay, Jared, will you grab that one? And then I'll give that to you, Barry. I live in the Bluff Villas that's closest to the Salty Dog, and we now have cars parked in our backyard. The fence was moved. Can you give me the history of why that fence was moved closer to the Bluff Villas property? That is the Salty Dog owner uh, moved it to their property line. So who erected the previous fence? I'm not sure. Do you know, Jared? Anybody know? Uh, my question is for uh, Toby, and it's um, the the pets on a leash issue. I understand that, and that's important. But w why don't you restate what the policy is on the beach related to pets on the beach and and leashes? Well, sure, I actually might know the answer to that. I believe it's uh, Labor Day is when the pets right. are required to um, between now and Labor Day. They're required to be on a leash on the beach as well. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's that's my understanding. Yes, I just want to do. I when you and we have no to... enforcement on on the beach issue. That's really, really the right. sheriff and the town of Hilton Head enforcing that. Uh, the other uh, is for you too, Toby. And that is when you mentioned the contractors and the daily fee. Uh, that you know, if your uh, landscape company you know comes to see you about you know paying more each month, what what happened with annual fees? you know, in terms of a contractor's annual fees? Did they go up? They did. Uh, the, uh, someone servicing the community that wants to buy an annual decal still has the ability to do that. 
uh, they, the board elected to raise those fees to uh, by $25. So depending on what type of decal you buy, every all decals went up by $25. The large majority of the people that service sea pines buy an annual decal that where we just wave them in because we roughly 4,600, I believe, decals that we sell annually to plumbers, landscapers, whatever the case may be. So they, that, they still have the ability to do that. What we've also done is we've created a hang tag that is for the domestic housekeeping. Uh, we have a lot of rental properties in here and majority of these people work out of their own personal vehicle. Well, the, the housekeeper is not gonna purchase a decal to go on their personal car. So what we did, we've designed a hang tag. It's the same price as a decal the company gives us a list of the employees. So if we stop someone and they have a hang tag in their car, we can look to see that Toby McSwain's an employee of this company and should be in possession of this hang tag. So now the hang tag can kind of go from car to car to help the, and it's really for the, for the housekeeping staff is what it's for. Yeah, just as a follow up, so the, if a contractor comes to you and says I'm paying more for my fee every day, you mm -hmm. might want to find out whether they have an annual fee you know, or they really are paying a daily fee. Well, that's well, you, yeah, bring that's your that's a valid point. No, I'm yeah, just I saying mean, it's just yeah. something to take into consideration. Because the annual decal that they can purchase is one price. If they're bringing a trailer, that has been a change where they do, are required to pay it. So I think it's, if I'm not mistaken, Sarah, it's a hundred dollars more, right? If they're pulling a trailer. Yes, per axle. So if you're pulling a vehicle or trailer, your the fee for the annual decal goes up. Uh, but they do have that ability to do that. But if you've got someone that, that works, you know, a couple times a month, they they're probably are just paying the daily rate to get into the, to the plantation. Thank you, Toby. Jared, we'll have a question up front. Just following up on that, how much additional money will that raise for CSA? Brett? We don't know yet. Surely you have an estimate. Well, we have an estimate on the increase for the 4600 the $25 times 4600 mm -hmm. But we don't know how many commercial vehicles. We've never counted those uh, and separated it on an annualized basis from a $6 pass to, you know, whether your purpose coming into Sea Pines is uh, as a visitor going to Harbor Town or to um, um, Sea Pines Center versus coming in and paying $6 on a commercial decal and purchasing that, or pass and purchasing that. And, and I know there's been a lot of discussion, and, and I appreciate the gentleman bringing up the gate fee. I might view it a little different. The, the, the $10 fee, I, I think it's worth having a discussion that everybody's aware that one of the plans is to raise our HOAs considerably to meet budget needs in the next, in the very near future. One of the ways to help alleviate what property owners pay is an increase in that gate fee. And, and, and I personally don't think $10 make us seem like we're stuffy or we don't want anybody out. We, in my point of view, that only, they're paying to help maintain this property. And, and if that, chases somebody away for a couple dollars, then maybe we don't want those people coming in here. And and we're starting to get very, very crowded at Harbor Town, very, very crowded at uh, the Beach Club. And, you know, we need to look ahead. How do you control that growth? We want people to come. We want them to feel comfortable. But at the same time, if, if you're a property owner and a resident and you spend a lot of time here, all those things need to be taken into consideration and how is that balanced fairly? And I, for one, hope they continue it and do we have any idea when that may or may not occur? As far as an increase? At, at the gate for the day trippers. And is there any plans to maybe make them use the trolley system a little more? Well, we do have uh, trolley plans. The there, there would need to be a proposal from um, the gate entry committee, from the, the parties that have the control over the fee itself, which is the CSA board in conjunction with the Sea Pines Resort in conjunction with Sea Pines Center. So that initial 
discussion is occurring on a change of rate, uh, but we don't have a determination at this point yet. Felice Lamarca, um, I, while we're talking about this, I wanted to also remind everyone, I would love to raise the gate fee to $10 across the board. In fact, the vacationers and guests, um, I think, can handle that and it would help us. <clears throat> but I want you to remember that while an increase in the gate fee across the board or just for commercial you say decreases our input, our cost. It doesn't because all these tradespeople, when we increase the cost to them, which we do every year, decals or whatever, they pass it on to us guys. We're paying for it. So if you don't give us an assessment to handle it, we're gonna pay it the other way. So please remember that the commercial people, they don't live here. They're coming and driving hours away to come work for us. We need to stop making it difficult for them. More comments on gate fees. I think we ought to change the name gate fee to parking fee because that's what it really is. And wherever you go in this world, you pay $10 to park. Uh, this, I got to pay $10 to get in is a bad rap. We've got a transportation system. We've got a parking place for everybody, and that's the way we ought to market it. That's not a question, obviously. <laughs> Other questions? All right, Derek, I'll go to you next. Okay. Sue fights, and I live in Lawton Woods, and we've had a challenge, and this is probably for Toby more than, um, and after some research, we have found we have two properties that are being rented to Sea Pine, excuse me, Sea Pines Resort workers, which they desperately need. But there's five young ladies in one two bedroom house, and there's five young men in another two bedroom house with five cars each. So we've done some research, and as far as we understand, is that um, the cars can prop park on the property as long as they're not obstructing the road or the open. Um, space or the leisure trails and on that's a that's a push for our small properties in a patio lot um, we have had incidences when some of the cars have been on the road and what I want to know actually is um, your officers are very very nice in the area are they proactive or reactive? I mean, will they will they see the car and then ask them to move it, or do they wait for one of us, other property owners, to call? That's that's a question. Okay. Um, the first situation, yes, there parking regulations. There's nothing in the covenants that says that they can't park in the front yard. Now we. We discourage that, and when we get a call, we, we do respond to the location that says, please, we don't want you parking in the front yard. We ask the cars to be in the driveway. Parking on the shoulder of the road, parking, that which is a current agenda on the safety and security committee that they're looking at, is are we going to continue to allow roadside parking? Some areas can handle roadside parking because a car can get far enough off the road to not obstruct an ambulance or emergency vehicles or whatever the case may be. Others are not. So if they're obstructing the roadway and we, as patrol rides by, we stop it. We don't wait for a property owner to call. It's They're blocking the roadway. We address it right then and there. Uh, I can get with the resort. I mean, because there is some other opportunities. I mean, they have a, a welcome center that cars can be parked in. We have the trolley lots that we let cars stay overnight. So there's some options to hopefully help try to get this cleaned up. Toby. Yeah. Toby. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this was brought to my attention by another Lawton Woods <laughs> person. And after our committee meeting yesterday, I asked John Monroe at Sea Pines if he would look into it for me. Mm -hmm. And he has. And he said that they are making alternate arrangements for parking some of the vehicles at those two houses. But it might take a few days. So it, if it doesn't work, then call Toby. We did talk about it, and, and he yeah. was very proactive and got right on it. I, I think it was resolved 
that part of it within yeah. an hour. So. Yeah, we have some other options. We were in the same with the rental guests. I mean, we can't control the number of passes currently with our current system of what goes out on a rental unit. And we have a house that shows up and there's five vehicles we'll, we'll, that will only hold two. They've got to go to the trolley lot to, to stay overnight. So. Uh, I'd like to know when we're going to hear from the resort with about their referendum, first of all. And then I'd like you to explain the first right of refusal that the Sea Pines Resort holds, what that means to us or me. It's just come up and a lot of people have never really heard about it before and I was just curious what that means. Well, uh, the, as far as the resort communication, do we have anything scheduled? Have they communicated anything that's scheduled at this point? There was the meeting that the resort hosted on May 30th. To this, um, at this point, they have not given me any new dates or times to be able to communicate to the community regarding um, future events, but it's my understanding that they are working to get those scheduled. So as soon as we, CSA, get any information from the Sea Pines Resort, we will, like we did last time, communicate those in, um, informational sessions on their behalf. You know, uh, as far as a first right of refusal uh, goes, a first right of refusal is just that. It's a, the, the right of some other party to, uh, uh, in this case, purchase uh, your property if you're selling your property and you have a contract on that. They have a right to refuse or to match that, that amount of money and good terms of uh, those conditions. I understand they have. I can't tell you where, but you know, yes, I understand they have. Fairly rarely, but they have. Sue Emke, the right of first refusal has been used um, at Fairway One Villas. Since then, they have indicated they want all of the Fairway One Villas Therefore, no realtor will show the property. They cannot sell their property on the open market. That is what the problem is at the moment. And it, the right of first refusal is on probably at least 90% of the property. When you bought your property, you signed a little piece of paper that it, it would be there if the resort wants it. The resort probably doesn't want 90% of the property, but they do want 10% or potentially. That's the problem. Another one, and I don't know how much that CSA has a voice, but I as one property owner would like them to know that, and, and I understand they have a right to move the chairs up on the beach at the beach club. I don't know how many people go out and frequent the beach during the day, but they have moved those chairs way up to the high tide mark. So during high tide, you know, I as a property owner, it, it's hard to find some place to sit. And if you have children and grandchildren here with you and trying to get space other than walking a long way and with that high tide up and the chairs were close, it's hard to get there. So I, I, I'm pleased to send to the board that they can tell the resort we need some resolution to that. Uh, I understand I've been told, well, they own it and they have a right to do it. Well, that definitely impacts my quality of life here, and I'm sure it does a lot. And, and I'd like them to hear it again that we need to be a pay, you know, especially if they need our support on a referendum. I want their support in that regard. Yeah, uh, you know, I think a, a good point uh, to bring up, and it's really the appropriate place, is probably our next board meeting. You have representatives of the resort on the board, and um, they can hear that from you directly at that board meeting. You certainly have an opportunity to make those comments and to provide that information. Other questions? I think the one thing that I would say um, is you have every right to call the resort too. So, you know, ask for Steve um, Birdwell or Cliff McMacken. Steve's the president of the resort. Cliff McMacken is the director of development for the resort. And, uh, you know, they're, they both, you know, will be happy to answer specific questions that you have. 
you know, about that and about what their rights are. Um, you know, they're certainly um, share this um, resort with us and we're doing our best, I think, to kind of pull ourselves together so that we can make some significant changes that, and do it in a unified way. So feel free to do that. Um, I think in terms of bringing it up with the board issues, absolutely, you can certainly do that. But if you have some individual concerns, and many of you do sometimes have individual concerns, uh, make sure you take advantage of just uh, getting in touch with them. Thanks. Sue? And, and on that, the, the resort owns from, there, there are lines that are, are drawn uh, arbitrarily based on the average mean high tide, and that line moves. I don't know how often they yeah, the, do it. It's every 10 years or something. The, the line doesn't actually move. That line was well, established when the land was transferred. The high tide mark does move, but when they platted that piece, that was recorded, and that, that boundary line stays in place. Okay. They can't, and when they have to register that for alcoholic uh, beverage, uh, control purposes and their license, they have to give them the boundaries of that parcel and they're specific to the registered plat, recorded plat. Yeah, there, there is a recorded plat of that. I have seen it. Um, okay. Testing, testing. From um, we're going to hold, we have to use the microphones for people to be heard. I'd be happy to check into something right. that's being done outside the boundary, but I'm that's not aware of that. This mics. is the first I've, been, I've heard that they might be moving outside the boundary. Happy to check and, and follow up on that. There's orange and blue. Jared, will you take that mic to Sue, please? That, yeah, Shore Beach Services provides rentals in conjunction with a town agreement uh, to do so to pay for their lifeguard services. Just a reminder, if, we, if you guys don't use the microphones, nobody on the video can hear anything that just got talked about <laughs> at all, period. So please, uh, just as a, a request, we have to use the microphone so they can hear what's being videotaped. That will be posted to our website and to our Facebook page, and to our mass email system. So I appreciate you using microphones when you can. <laughs> Brett. Other questions? Okay. I will bring you a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Maybe two. Okay. All, the, all the meetings that I've been to, the webinars on, on we, we've listened to those. I haven't heard one person say how much water capacity does sea pines have and sewer capacity. When you go putting 90 more units in one spot, that's 90 plus gallons of water every day. And the sewer is the same way. And when we had somebody talking about us uh, maybe a, a month or two ago, they were talking about water runoff, uh, 
the lagoons that are used to, to move water around. Mm -hmm. Who's watching that we don't over exceed because every property that's laying in sea pines has the right to water and sewer. Well, the public service district, the South Island public service district specifically is the entity that serves, that provides water and sewer uh, uh, services in sea pines and the, some of the surrounding area. And they have informed us that they have capacity uh, to do additional things. Now, anything specific to this development, I can't speak to, to the lines that are down there, but whatever would be required from a permitting perspective would require them to provide those services in their permit and in their construction. Do we have a count on how many vacant lots sit here in Sea Pines that do not have a house on, but could possibly have a house on it? The last time I saw I saw JR here earlier, he prepares a list, I think it's about 120. So we have 120 plus possibly 90, and everybody's feeling good about water and sewer, and the roads, you know, we had a lot of discussion before about roads, water running off the whole nine yards. I don't see any of that being corrected. Versus well, we, we are working diligently on the stormwater system. And we're working with the town specifically, actually, we meet with them almost weekly, if not more frequently than that, uh, on specific issues. And some of them are in Harbor Town that will need to be corrected. And we're already provided to the town uh, the request for that. And we're awaiting a response from them on some of those items. Some of those items we're going to move forward with on our own. Uh, Brett, if I may answer the gentleman's question, I'm Ward Kirby, and I am a commissioner on the South Island Public Service District. There is adequate capacity for all of the existing lots and all in Sea Pines. Uh, when the development is constructed or comes into being in Harbor Town, uh, the resort will have to pay capacity charges for the increased capacity of sewer and water usage down there, but the facilities are in place to handle that capacity at this time. There, there will be a usage fee added to that to add that to pay for that extra uh, capacity usage that they will need at that point. Thanks, Ward. Other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Stay dry out there. Thank you.